Good morning, TIC. Like Pastor Peter said, I'm Liz, for those of you I haven't met before. Um, and I attend church here with my husband, Matt, who is right here. Our two sons, Toby and Samson, and technically, I guess, one more baby boy who's on the way. And we have just been so thankful for this church, which we were able to find a few months after we moved to Taipei last summer for Matt's job. Um, one thing we've especially loved is just being able to build deeper community here in our Connect group, which meets at our home in Nehu. So this is, I guess, my shameless plug to say, if you're not in a Connect group, please join one. It's been such, a, such an amazing and growing experience for us. When I was 24 years old, I quit my job in the US, sold my car, packed my bags, and moved to Calcutta, India. I was, I was moving there to work with IGM, like Pastor Peter talked about, and while I was there, I encountered some of the most horrific human pain and suffering I had ever seen. But I also saw God's powerful work of justice and restoration in ways that I had never seen before. As Pastor mentioned, IGM combats slavery and other forms of violent oppression, both in India and throughout the world. You might be thinking that sounds like a big job, and it definitely is, and IGM doesn't do it alone. IGM has always partnered with various government agencies and NGOs in the countries where they work. But a couple of years ago, IGM decided we need more partners. We actually want to end slavery, and this is a big job. So they started an initiative called Freedom Sunday, which is actually what we are doing today. And I'm really thankful uh, for the chance to introduce you to this idea. The purpose of Freedom Sunday is to mobilize the global church to do three things. First, to see the often hidden problem of slavery. If we don't see a problem, we can't do anything to solve it. So this is the first step. Second is for us to understand God's heart to end it. One of my very favorite aspects of God's character is his justice. This means that he hates injustice and he is working relentlessly to end it. And the third goal of Freedom Sunday is for us, as his church, to join him in ending it. This is also something that I love about God, this mysterious way that he invites us into his work of justice. He could do all of it on his own. Uh, Derek actually mentioned this a couple weeks ago. God can do anything. He's all powerful. But for some reason, he chooses to do the work of advancing his kingdom through his people. Okay, so let's talk about the problem of slavery. Did you know there are more slaves in the world today than at any time in human history? According to the Global Slavery Index, there are 40.3 million slaves. If you were to add up the populations of these five countries, Taiwan, Singapore, Belize, Eswatini, and Kyrgyzstan, I think we have people from each of those countries here, Every single people living in those countries, add them all up, and the number still does not reach 40.3 million. This number is absolutely daunting. The reality is millions of people woke up this morning to an endless day of backbreaking labor, molding bricks, working on fishing boats, mining to make smartphones run. Millions of children will search for sleep tonight after endless hours of being sexually exploited in brothels, bars, and even online. I want to share a short video with you that I hope will make the reality of slavery a bit more vivid. I want to prepare, to prepare you that the content of this video is heavy and there are some parts that are intense, but I also hope that this video gives you hope about what God is doing to end it. You're working 14, 18 hour days with very little sleep, no freedom, 
dignity is taken away from them and and that's something nobody should have to endure we had a number of years ago two of the mongol laborers escaped from a facility and they were tracked down by the owners of the facility and and brought back and as a punishment for what they had done their hands were chopped off we would go to the government officers and we'd say sir there is a bonded labor case and almost always the response was there is no bonded labor in my area what are you talking Can you, there's a girl who's very afraid, almost unable to walk. This is Kumar. He was abandoned by his mother, and his father was suddenly killed. Orphaned and alone, he was accountable for his parents' debts. And at just seven years old, he was forced into slavery. I'm going to tell you about one day, sir. I'm going to tell you about one day, sir. Kumar remembers a day where he was so ill he couldn't get out of bed. Immediately, his owner came looking for him. I want to end the valley for any getting up. No, I saw what I said last summer. Abara and the quarter of a room put on it. Abara, so called it's done. What's up, and the last year of the summer, and the last year of the summer. Kumar was trapped by debt and a slave owner who beat him continuously. He, like so many, had no remaining hope for a way out. discovered the horrific conditions in the brick factory where Kumar and others were being forced to work against their will. And, based on their undercover video evidence, local government authorities and police came alongside IJM to conduct a rescue operation. The more and more we are doing these rescues, people are getting aware that people are being abused, there is bonded labor, there is trafficking. Also, the law is going to take its course as well as perpetrators go behind. When the team arrived in the morning and entered the brick factory, 15 men, women, and children were rescued and given their freedom back. Then, they were each given a certificate to prove that they no longer owe any debts to their former owner. And one was for Kumar. After being rescued, IJM placed Kumar in their aftercare program to heal. You, you'd ask him a question anytime, no matter what, and you'd say, the one thing I want to do, sir, is I want to study. He was clear about that. And then, they enrolled him in school for the first time. Today, he is studying to be a social worker to help those still suffering like he did. And what we do at IJM is we go look for that lost sheep, that girl that's being abused, that widow who's been run out of her home. And we will search for her until we find her. That's how our Father has loved us. That's how we are called to love others. Not to search for them until we've satisfied ourselves. Not to search for them until it gets really hard. But to go after them 
until we find them, to be relentless in our love. I had the amazing privilege of meeting Kumar several years ago, and he is a really funny, goofy, fun-loving guy. Uh, he has really big dreams for his future. He loves life. And he's definitely not what I expected when I met someone who was once a slave. But that's because slavery wasn't the end of the story for Kumar. But what about the 40.3 million people who are still in slavery? I think we need to understand that slavery is as real and prevalent and terrible as it's ever been in history. This may be surprising because it's against the law in every country in the world. So it's not done out in the open the way it was in many of our history books. But it's allowed to thrive when laws are not enforced and when perpetrators go unpunished. It's certainly tempting to feel hopeless about this situation, and I've been there at times. But I want to share three things that give me hope. First, the Bible is absolutely clear that God sees those who are afflicted by violent oppression. Second, the Bible is also clear that God is just, and he is working relentlessly to bring freedom and restoration to those who are still trapped in dark places. Psalm 10, verses 17 and 18, says, You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted, you encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortal, mortals will never again strike terror. The third thing that gives me hope is that I have seen God's justice brought to bear through the work of IJM and many partners. For the eight years that I spent working there, thousands of people were rescued from slavery and other forms of violent oppression and hundreds of perpetrators were held accountable for their crimes. In Luke 14 and 18, sorry, 4, 18 and 19, Jesus publicly announced the reason for his ministry. He said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus' ministry of good news, the gospel, is not only to tell of the good news of salvation, which is amazing news. It's not just about ending the oppression of our souls by sin, but also ending violent physical oppression of people in the world right now. So earlier I talked about the third goal of Freedom Sunday being that we join God in ending slavery. In scripture, God hasn't just called us to preach the good news of salvation, but also to seek justice. Look what it says in Micah 6, 8 and Isaiah 1, 17. In Micah, God says that we are to do justice. In Isaiah, he tells us to seek justice, to defend the oppressed, and take up the cause of the fatherless. So for the 40.3 million people living in slavery, we know that God sees them, we know that he hates the injustice and oppression that they are experiencing, and we know that he wants us to join him in pursuing justice and freedom for all of them. But what does that mean for us here at TIC? It doesn't necessarily mean that we all move to India. I'm hoping today is just the beginning of us trying to figure out what it does mean for us. As a community, we can keep learning more about the problem of slavery. And, and seeking to understand God's heart for justice. There will be a lunch meeting sometime in January or February for us to continue this conversation, for us to pray together about what we can do in Taiwan and beyond. So stay tuned and please join us. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the work of IJAM specifically, I brought some brochures, they'll be in the foyer, and you can come talk to me if you have any questions. But the most important thing that we can do right now is that we can pray. I'd like to encourage each of you to actually pray a very bold prayer, 
a prayer that I've been scared to pray in the past, but I've come to believe is actually what I think God wants. And that is to pray that God would bring an end to slavery in our lifetime. So I'm going to end by just praying that prayer now, so please join me. God, I'm so thankful that you are a God of justice. I'm so thankful that you see what is hidden from our eyes. God, that you care so deeply for those who are experiencing incredible pain and suffering. And I don't understand, Father, why you don't end it right now, because I know you have that power. But it's clear in Scripture that you choose to do your work of bringing your kingdom here on this earth through your people. And so, God, continue doing the good work that I've had the privilege of seeing you do. And, Lord, will you show us how you want us to be a part of it? God, we want to see 40.3 million people no longer enslaved. God, we want to see you bring an end to this problem in our lifetime. We ask you for faith that we would believe you can do it. We ask you for hearts that are open to understanding more of who you are, God. We We ask you for hearts that are sensitive to understanding this really difficult reality that exists in the world. God, thank you that that we have today, that we have each other, this community, uh, to wrestle together, to pray together, to seek you together. Lord, we pray for Pastor Peter as he comes up um, to teach us about the Good Samaritan. We pray that we would understand your justice and mercy more through this passage. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.